Well, Ernie, I think it's important for theologians uh, to listen to biologists and to enter into dialogue. I think that's an important uh, thing, and I think that those of us who uh, work out of a religious frameworks have to try to uh, understand the world of science, have to understand how you operate and uh, some of your thought patterns. And I know uh, one of the important things in that world of biology is the whole evolutionary process that's become part of your general worldview since Darwin in the middle of the 19th century. And uh, a lot of that evolutionary thought has worked its way into the world of theology. You know, we tend more and more now to see the evolution of dogmas, for example, evolution in the life of the church. It's just, as Teilhard de Chardin once said, evolution isn't simply a biological theory. It's a light within which we view all of reality. So we've learned something from you biologists just by osmosis, even if we don't know the details of of your discipline, there's absolutely no doubt that the sense of process, of evolution, uh, has become part of the theological religious world as well. Um, maybe we can, um, let's uh, talk a little bit here about uh, evolution as you see it. I mean, what that means in your own work and how you as a biologist, um, how that works. Does that uh, sort of interested uh, not only professionally, but personally? Maybe I ask you professionally first. I mean, how does evolution come into play in your own classes and teaching and so on? I, th I think it's uh, the foundation for all of biology. And uh, unless one is, is teaching a, a very practically oriented course in biology where you have to show students how to do something for a practical reason, a more vocationally oriented type of thing. Um, a any course in biology uh, has to be anchored in uh, talking about evolution. That is to say, understanding the, the, the wide and neat variety that we see in the living world, plants, animals, etc., uh, and, and the different adaptations, to understand how they could have come about uh, and what role they play in um, uh, the the life of the animal and how it interacts with, or the life of the plant and how it interacts with other organisms in the environment. Um, so e evolution is the core of of biology, and uh, I think all of biology is really directed towards uh, understanding how evolution takes place, mm -hmm. and um, uh, conversely, uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, impregnates all of biology because it, it, it explains how things did in fact mm -hmm. come about. Then I was wondering personally, do you find yourself uh, thinking in evolutionary terms outside the classroom? Does that become, as Teilhard suggested, a light uh, within which you view all of reality, your personal relationships or your family or your other uh, aspects of your life? Do you find a carryover from the classroom that way? Uh, yes, I do. It's um, uh, I, I don't know with respect to my family and close kin and things mm -hmm. like that, but it, it certainly, as the more I've read about it and, and uh, the more I've studied it, uh, really has become uh, a, a, a world view, I guess, that uh, it, is, it is something that allows me to understand um, the universe. I sort of view that's the, that's the our, goal of life our, is to understand our place in the universe yeah. and the... And, mm. and, uh, uh, it, it's from uh, seeing and understanding evolution that I can I can anchor myself in the universe and understand the relationships uh, and understand a little bit more uh, what it, what it's all about. Is it too personal to ask if that influences your religious outlook? Then oh, I think it has to. Uh, it it, it uh, and, and and it has yes very much so. Uh, I. Um, I, I, I have come to the point now that I, I really seriously disagree with uh, uh, religious thinkers who say that, that there is no conflict between religion and, and evolution and that the two can coexist together. Uh, it, it forces such a, uh, uh, a reversal of, of standard ideas of uh, deities and, and uh, uh, the role of a deity or the, the role of anything supernatural or non-material uh, in the human life that uh, they just I I think it's a big co-optation to say that they could they can fit together oh we got an argument going there <laughs> <laughs> I think really I mean I, I would put it this way that I mean I would see uh, problems with uh, traditional religious thinking there's no doubt about that 
In other words, if you view God and human relationship in static terms, if you think of the God as a being up in the sky, if you think of the teaching in the book of Genesis as literally true that the world is 4,000 years old and uh, that, you know, things were made on one 24-hour period or sun up to sun down as the Genesis account would have it. I mean, certainly, I mean, I see uh, difficulties in that uh, way. I think the question is, is uh, when biology and the evolutionary theory is viewed in um, particular ways and in which Christianity is viewed in certain ways, are they still necessarily incompatible? I think that's the question. And uh, I, I don't think you can give just a quick, simple answer to that without probing the various ways that evolution could be explained from the biological side or seeing the ways that uh, Christianity could be explained. In other words, I think you'd be hard-pressed logically to just make your point that there is an irreconcilable, essential conflict that never could be bridged. I mean, you'd have to have studied all of the various ways that Christianity has been proposed or understood before you could do that, or even all the potential ways that it could be understood and uh, proposed. Well, it, it seems that, that, to my mind, the, 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 the major difficulty is the fact that the stuff of evolution, the variation, uh, does in fact come about in, in a random fashion. Uh, that's the randomness in evolution. Uh, that means that there's absolutely no reason that anything should have happened, that what we have now is totally contingent, uh, that, that humans are uh, the contingent process of, of four and a half billion years of, of evolution. Um, if that's the case, then there is, and I think it is, then there is, is no necessary direction or progress to evolution. And um, it really... Uh, takes away what I would consider any job description uh, for, a, uh, for a god if, if, if it's totally outside this realm of contingency. Uh, I think that doesn't necessarily mean that, that uh, something like that can't exist, but as I said, it would, r to my mind, radically have to change your view of what, uh, mm. what a supreme being would do if it has no impact whatsoever or has had no impact whatsoever. On, uh, on humankind. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, of course, people have uh, wrestled with that various qu very question. And, and what I would say what biological science, evolutionary theory has done is been one of the major catalysts for a rethinking of the whole question of, the, of what uh, the deity is and how the deity functions in, in relationship to the world. And of course, there's been some people, uh, actually good scientists, who have uh, reconciled those things in their own mind. And we have people who have uh, been both believer and scientist, Alfred North Whitehead being a perfect example of someone who was deeply imbued with evolutionary kind of thought and worked out a whole theology we call process theology to encompass that. Whitehead himself was a, a scientist and worked out a whole uh, theism that based on evolutionary theory. So, I mean, the fact is that some people have done that or to their own satisfaction. Doesn't mean, and they have convinced many other people too, as we know there's a whole school of process theology uh, that, has, uh, that, w that people have found convincing in that regard. So, I mean, uh, just a, a quick dismissal of that or saying that's impossible seems to me one would have to, to look at the various efforts that have already been made and to, to show precisely how their own argumentation is faulty or before one could just say, well, that can't be. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, at all prepared to <laughs> dismiss uh, uh, thinkers in an area that, I, uh, that I'm no. not that well versed in. Uh, but I do think, and I think that you've, you've tended to suggest, that, that, it, that it does demand a, a radical refashioning of uh, what yeah. a deity would do and what, if any, influence it could have on humans. And my own personal thinking has been uh, that uh, uh, it influence, its influence would be uh, so rather negligible um, that uh, it would border almost on irrelevancy. But, you know, one of Whitehead's um, uh, famous statements was that, that the deity is, uh, is not an exception to the whole evolutionary framework which we find ourselves, but the supreme manifestation of it. 
In other words, he tries to work out a theism, that is a belief in God, that is entirely consonant with evolutionary theory. So it's not as though the God would be outside of the process and, and totally disconnected from it, but as he likes to say, the supreme exemplification. In other words, he sees God, the, the deity himself, if I can use the male pronoun there, to, um, to exemplify the process, that God's part of the process, and is in, a, is in an evolving state himself in relationship to the world. But, I mean, it's just one example. But, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do, I guess, is to challenge what I took was, you know, a rather strong statement on your part that, uh, that you know, that, that these two things are just plain irreconcilable. I mean, you know, you could say, well, they appear irreconcilable to you, but, I mean, there's a lot of other people who haven't found it oh, that certainly, way. Oh, yeah, certainly, yeah. But the point, I think, where we would get the agreement is that the, of the, the necessity to radically rethink yes, theism right. as a result of it. And, and that's exactly what has happened. I mean, I think much of modern theology has been an attempt to respond to the Darwinian revolution, to, to figure that out. And uh, I don't know, Ernie, if we should stay with that point uh, for a while longer or uh, launch into uh, another one. But well, go ahead. one thing I have found in my readings and, and discussions is, uh, as I mentioned, the, the crux of the matter is the fact of, of the randomness of the, of the mutations or the meat of the, the variation in, in evolution. Uh, if, in fact, these things are random and there's absolutely no reason to think otherwise. Uh, let, let me try we, then to things on, become very, very contingent. I, I, let me come on your turf philosophically I mean, as a philosopher type, I mean, and say, all right, I mean, if I just look at what we do know, I mean, so we got a world that's four and a half billion years old, right? And we had simple, at uh, some point, life forms appear, uh, extremely simple. And these life forms become more complex. And, and as time goes on, what has happened as a result of the whole process is we've moved from uh, to more complex life forms and then we've uh, moved to uh, greater abilities in those life forms and then we've had some point uh, the we broke off I mean in terms of monkeys and uh, chimpanzees and so on and we've gotten a hominid strain we've moved into Neanderthal man and so on but what and then we've gotten more um, consciousness reflection going on in the world and now we're at a stage where you know technology and so on gives us even greater consciousness a global sense now why can't apart from however I know that process worked why can't I say that in, as I look at that I perceive purpose and direction what's happened is you've moved from non-life to life You've moved from simple life to more complex life. You've moved from non-reflective life to reflective life. That seems, that's the story of evolution. I mean, as an outsider and non-biologist, I can look at that, learn that from you, and then say, as I view that, I see purpose. The purpose was, of the whole thing, was to move to greater consciousness. And that's what's happened. Now, how are you going to prove to me that, it, that, it, that there isn't some direction or purpose in that? I th Even I th if it was random. I think that uh, one of the things is in, in terms of the, the, the question of complexity, um, it, it's, it's not all that clear that uh, uh, evolution has in fact moved towards greater and greater complexity as one looks into the, into the fossil records of uh, uh, some of the early invertebrates, they were extremely complex, uh, rather bizarre organisms. Uh, that. Uh, uh, certainly, one could argue we're, we're much more complex than some of the some of the existing invertebrates that that are around today. So, there's not necessarily. It depends on on if you want to focus on one particular group of organisms, that may be the case. But if if we want to focus on another particular group of organisms, uh, there's it's it's not uh, clear at all that there's been any increase in terms of complexity. Mm -hmm. So if, in fact, we're being very human-centered about this and just want to focus on ourselves and on our, our progenitors, et cetera, we might be able to see that that is what, had in fact, had happened. Um, but the, the, the knowledge of, of the mechanism of evolution that the evolutionary scientists are, are giving us today uh, clearly says that we're, in using Stephen Gould's term, were we to replay the tape of life again, um, there's no reason at all to think that the same things would have happened. Um, so 
in, in that sense, uh, there's no indication that there is any, w what we have ha did in fact happen, but uh, it need not have. Uh, I don't see the purpose or direction there. Well, just because you argue that it need not have happened, I mean, I, I could re readily admit that, that there's randomness and that if you replayed it, it's other thing, mutations could have happened and so on. But when I look at what did happen, apart from theorizing about what might have happened or gone differently, when you look at what happened, we got human beings walking around now who have greater consciousness. Let me move away from the complexity argument, al although even as a layperson, I mean, I'm not sure I want to buy that. I mean, wouldn't we say that the human brain, for example, the, the cortex and the human structure has a greater complexity than uh, previous brains, for example? That's true. As I said, if you want to focus on the humans, that, that is true, and, and, and that that, well, that There's is an one implication that one is one is looking towards humans, but one could one could focus <coughs> on uh, uh, certain uh, types of invertebrates, uh, where the fossil record tells us that the members of that spe uh, of that gen genus or that family uh, shows a far richer degree of complexity in the Precambrian seas 600 million years ago than exists now. Than it exists now, huh? So, I mean, I would have to say, to make my point, I mean, uh, to make it legitimate within your framework, that it, it, from at least one perspective, the perspective of the human beings on this earth, there is uh, a greater complexity occurs. So the human brain is more complex than the chimp brain or the gorilla or the monkey. Yes, uh, but not, not, not more complex from my understanding than Neanderthal. In terms okay, of science, explain that. Well, it, it, uh, as I understand the fossils, I'm not a, 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 no. an anthropolog uh, a physical anthropologist, but uh, as I understand it, the the size of the Neanderthal brain uh, was slightly larger than the average size of the of the modern the day. The size got, uh, relate to complexity. Uh, it's all we have to compare with, uh, and well, we can compare. Well, we can chimp brains with human brains now, right? Yes, and, 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 and human brains are larger. Are more, they have they have well, they're more a greater number of folds to them. Yeah, uh, and we can anatomically. Uh, my understanding is that the Neanderthal uh, was in fact slightly larger and would equally be as as wrinkled, if that's the type of complexity, mm -hmm. than than uh, modern day Homo sapiens. Okay. So uh, the complexity, but the the, I, the the point that would um, again make more sense to me, or buttress my own argument, I suppose, is in terms of consciousness. I mean, it seems to me what has happened through the evolutionary process is you've re you've achieved greater consciousness. Now, uh, and and that would again, I, I can look back as a believer, I suppose, no doubt, out of a theistic framework, and say, well, I can see purpose in that. I can see direction. Purpose and direction is that in the whole evolutionary process, move towards greater consciousness, so that animals have greater consciousness than plants, and uh, that uh, chimpanzees have greater consciousness than lower forms of animal life. They show in their social uh, complexity and so on, greater uh, range and, and so on. And then, and then we got human consciousness, which seems like a quantum leap in a sense, that you have re the ability to reflect, to develop the arts, to have a clear uh, language. Maybe that'll get disputed here. I know I'll give you your chance. But I'm trying to sketch out my own sense of, of the direction and purpose here in relationship to consciousness. I, I think if one looks at the at the uh, evolution of humans, uh, one can see that that perhaps language was was one of the major things that uh, allowed humans to make your your quantum leap. Because with language, uh, maybe there is what where consciousness comes from. It's, it's an interesting question whether one can be conscious if they don't have language. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, with with language, and language is is definitely based in the. Uh, material aspect of the brain, so it's it's um, as well as the the type of language we have goes along with the anatomy of the vocal system. As these uh, anatomical structures evolved, humans gained another type of advantage. Along with language comes a lot of other things: uh, mm -hmm. the ability to uh, to to hold things in mind that aren't there anymore. Uh, the ability to deal much more efficiently with your environment, uh, and from that comes comes culture. So we enter into an entirely mm -hmm. different realm of evolution there. But I don't see it being 
its results are much more dramatic, but I don't see the original appearance of, of uh, the brain mechanisms to underlie language uh, being all that at all different from uh, mechanisms that uh, other animals would have that would allow them to be uh, to detect uh, differences on the basis of smell or what have you. It is a particular type of, of brain function, but a lot of things came from it. Came from it. And in your viewpoint, it, it, we would say, well, this was random that people were able to talk. It would be because of some natural selection that in terms of the larynx or the throat or the... And the brain, a number of different in, things in brain. Had, to have, had, to have, had to have happened. Yeah. Uh, it's not, once, once, they, once the variations appeared, it was no longer random that, right. that they were selected for. Because right, then as soon as you could speak, then you could warn people about things and you could stay alive A lot of selected advantage. And you there. could uh, remember things and uh, so on that you don't walk around wild animals or something. Mm. And you could make progress. So, I mean, your point is that it's random. I mean, in, you know, the, that the original selection is random, and therefore you seem to want to no, argue... No, the, 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 the original appearance. Yeah, the yeah. original appearance yeah. is it, random. It's right? random in a context, though. I mean, it did not just right. appear out of nowhere. It appeared within a, an organism that had right. its own biological history and had its own structure. So okay, it's so not that great a change, necessarily. Right, and, but you're also sort of limiting what you mean by random. There. Very much so. Yeah, okay. But in, in, in the way I hear you is then that you want to argue from that and say, therefore, there's no purpose to the whole thing. I want to look at the whole thing and say, well, we got from here to there over four and a half billion years. Now we got these humans walking around who can put their hand in front of them and look and say, by heavens, it took four and a half billion years for that hand to get produced. I can make that kind of statement. And I mean, that's something that a chimp can't do. And uh, I say, that's greater consciousness. I say, therefore, I detect purpose. I detect direction. And the direction is towards consciousness. So in other words, from my perspective, I'm looking at the overall thing, knowing a lot less than you know about the individual mechanisms of how this all happened. It seems to me you look at the individual mechanisms and arrive at a conclusion that says there's no purpose in the thing. Is that an accurate way of stating the the argument uh, as it's going on here? I, I think you're still one to look at, at it simply from the human perspective. I mean, we're, we're a squid able to reflect on things. Yeah, but uh, a squid s can't. That's the point. Squids can't <laughs> reflect. That's why we got this, this new situation but here. And that's exactly that. That's the key point in all of it here. I mean, we wouldn't be asking these great questions if we were squids. No, you, you value the reflection yes. as being a, a, a greater adaptation than perhaps uh, the a, a, behavior, a behavioral type of adaptation that a, that a squid might have. I mean, yeah, well, I, yeah, I do. Yeah, that's because I'm part of this species. That's right. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Homo so, sapiens. Yeah. And, but so are you so as a it, biologist. I mean, I'm back to that. So some of the first questions I asked you, does that, does that have influence on, on the overall thinking, worldview, and so on? Of course we come at Don't Don't you think that as humans, well, I suppose you don't have to, but I mean, it, consciousness seems to be quite a valuable adaptation. Definitely. Yeah. And, uh, and, and. Uh, are you prepared to say, you know, it makes us a higher form of life? Is that too much of a that, value that, judgment that's for you? That's too much, yeah. Too it, much. It, it it wouldn't we're we're different. Uh, we're, <laughs> new, we're, we're new. Yeah. Uh, we're we're 500,000 uh, years at the most. Uh, um, we really haven't had the test of time to know how, how much of an adaptation <laughs> consciousness really is. When you, when you tell me that, um, that, you know, practicing biologists today are, you know, view would say that the process, evolutionary process does not have purpose um, or direction, I mean, is that, are you telling me that's a 100% view or something? I mean, I, I, I know it isn't because I know practicing biologists who, who would hold purpose and direction. I would say that it is a 100% view whenever they have to talk professionally. Um, and but it yeah, but that's is, but to talk it, within but it the is, framework of your discipline. No, of course, that's true. But it is clear it is clear that uh, that the idea of progress, or or uh, if if we want to use that somewhat synonymous with purpose, uh, is is still present in terms of uh, 
um, subconsciously in terms of biology. As, as Roos had pointed out to me when he was here, he pu would pull introductory textbooks off of, off of my shelf and would definitely show that every textbook is oriented in such a way that ultimately you're studying biology to find out about mankind. Um, so there, there's, this, there's this unconscious bias. Uh, which we may never be able to get rid of. I mean, we are in charge of writing the textbooks and the squids aren't, so definitely yeah. we want to see everything <laughs> heading towards <laughs> us. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the, to, to recognize that these are biases uh, is a necess necessary part of, of thinking about biology and certainly about teaching about it. Well, when you say bias, you mean that the, uh, the bias that there's a purpose in it all? The bias that there's a purpose, yeah. the bias that it is headed towards us, the bias that everything yeah. that happens is, is uh, an adaptation. And, and a lot of things come from these biases. See, I mean, when you say the biologists, when they talk together, would say this. I mean, I understand that. But there's a larger question then. It's still the question, does this have purpose or not? And, and it seems to me you can't answer that from within the field of biology. You can't answer that question, is there purpose or not? I, that's a question that, that, that is a larger question. You have to step outside of the, of the biological framework to answer that question, it seems to me. And Ernie, I'm being unfair to you because I give you no time <laughs> to respond to that. I'm sorry, but you did have uh, 26 <laughs> minutes before <laughs> this. And I guess we've been talking about the b relationship between biology and theology and a dialogue uh, between that. And we, we've been talking about the purpose of evolution. And you're telling me you don't see it because, in my mind, you focus on the selection process. I'm saying I see it when I look at the larger movement towards consciousness. This needs further discussion, but we're going to have to stop there.